Today I'm going to be talking about the PS Audio Aspen FR5. And let's see here. These retail for about $3,500 per pair without the stands or about $4,000 per pair with the stands. I was actually loaned these direct to review by PS Audio, but I wasn't paid or given anything for free to do the review. So I'm going to review them and send them back. Let's go ahead and just kind of talk about some of the specs up front while I show you a video of these set up in my living room. These come in two different colors, a satin white or a satin black. The enclosure type is a passive radiator with one six by nine oval rear firing speaker as the passive radiator on the back. The high frequency transducer is a two and a half inch planar magnetic. The low frequency transducer is a six and a half inch woofer cast frame curve woven polypropylene advanced magnet structure. Crossover frequency, 1750 Hertz. Linkwitz Riley sixth order acoustic. That's pretty steep. And that's going to pay off in a little bit later. Sensitivity expected at 83.5 decibels, nominal impedance six ohm, recommended power 50 to 150 watts. Some of you may get tired of me saying this, but a lot of people are new here. So when I talk about angles of the speaker, this is an overview of what I'm talking about. Zero degrees is pointed directly at you. Toe in would be blue, toe out would be red. And when I talk about distance from the wall, this is what I'm talking about from the back of the speaker to the wall. Okay. So continuing on with the subjective, a general overview of what I take away from this listening session is that these speakers do get low, but in my room, what I found is that if I pull them out from the wall, that standard three feet or one meter that all audiophiles are told they have to pull the speakers out from the wall. And yes, I understand why, but that's a different video. The bass was not as ample as I wanted it to be in my room, most likely because of a room mode around 40 Hertz or so. But what I did was I pushed them back a little bit closer to the wall. As you can see in this photo, they're roughly about one foot off the wall or one third meter off the wall. With this positioning, the bass was very robust. These get down to mid thirties, no problem in the room. Now room modes matter. So there may be a suck out or there may be a boast, boast, a boost. But since I have another reference speaker that I'm able to compare these side by side, I can kind of get a feel for, well, what's the relative extension. But then again, we actually have the data to know objectively. So I can take the room out of it if I want to. Ain't that cool? Uh, position wise, you know, in terms of aiming it, when I put these speakers directly on axis, which is most of the time how speakers are designed to be listened to, like directly pointing at you, that black line I showed you earlier, they were too treble heavy. And I towed them completely off, 30 degrees facing straight out into the room. Well, it was maybe just a little bit too rolled off. So then what I did was I pointed them at my shoulders and I said, well, that's a little bit better. And then I went and looked at the data and I saw the data kind of aligns to where it says that about 20 degrees off axis. So crossing somewhere behind your head is most likely the best starting point. Now you can try any of those angles that I just talked about. You can try pointing directly at you. You can try even crossing the streams in front of you, making them towed in if you want to. But based on what I'm seeing in the data and based on what I heard in my listening session, I would say that probably 20 degrees that crossing behind you is probably the best way to go. So aim them where they're paired up and they're crossing behind you instead of in front of you, okay? Tonality wise, for the most part, I enjoyed the speaker. Now, when we look at the data, there are going to be aberrations there that we're going to see and we're going to go, oh, that doesn't look good. But the only one that stood out to me audibly is there's a resonance of some sort around 600, 650 hertz. Now, I couldn't tell you exactly where it was when I was listening, but something stood out to be a little bit more chesty, a little bit more forward, if you will. And I actually first noticed it when I was listening to a Nora Jones track, um, Light as a Feather, off of her The Fall album. So that's a, that's a good track. I didn't really notice it with Mel tracks, and, and I went through a lot of different songs before I got to that particular Nora Jones track. But when I listened to that, I thought, this sounds like it's just like it's something's off. It sounded like it was standing out a little bit forward. So I got up out of my seat, walked out to my garage. I pulled up the data for the speaker. I looked at it and I looked across the spectrum and I said, well, here's all these little things that could be it, but this thing stands out the most. And I'll show you in the data a little bit more. So I grabbed my EQ app for my WIM Ultra and I went to the EQ and I brought down 620 Hertz with a Q of about four, about two or three decibels. Here's a screenshot. 
The cool thing about this is if you have a standard graphic equalizer, most one third octave equalizers are gonna land on about 630 Hertz. Just notch that down 2 dB, boom, everything's good. Matter of fact, that would be the only thing that I would change about the speaker tonality. There are, again, other aberrations, other things that are occurring with the speaker, but I don't really know that I would bother messing with any of them because none of them stood out to be a problem for me, at least in terms of overall tonal balance. In terms of actual technical accuracy, yeah, you might want to improve some of those areas, but in terms of overall tonal balance, I like the speaker sans that 600 or so hertz bump because it sounded like it was a little bit too forward in the mid range, okay? Let's see here, what else did I get from this? Oh, the wide soundstage radiation. I really like that. But that also comes into play in how you aim the speaker. So if you point it directly at you, what you're going to typically get, I mean, assuming everything else is the same between comparisons, right? If you point speakers directly at you, you're going to have improved focus in imaging, not and imaging, but focus in imaging. So if an instrument is supposed to be in this location or this location, it's going to sound like they're in those specific locations. If you tow the speakers out more away from you, and even if you cross them in front of you, that coherency, that focus in imaging is going to start to fade a little bit. It's going to start getting a little bit more diffuse. So those very precise instruments are going to sound a little bit fatter and a little bit fatter. What you trade for that lack of pinpoint imagery is broader soundstage radiation if you tow them out. And there's some other things you can get when you crossfire them, but I almost never recommend crossfiring speakers in front of you. So because these speakers actually sound more linear, off axis towed out about 20 degrees, they also are gonna benefit from being towed out in terms of soundstage radiation. So they're gonna have a little bit wider radiation. They're gonna interact with your walls a little bit more, which is okay, because this is a pretty good performing off axis speaker as well, which means the direct sounds are gonna be very similar in timbral balance to the reflected sound, so that's good. The thing you do lose when you have a broader soundstage radiation is you lose some of that focus. So that's just gonna be something that you're gonna to have to consider. You know, what are your trade-offs? And your room matters. You know, if you have a very highly reflective room, then the ability to have that pinpoint imaging is probably gonna suffer a little bit more too now that you're aiming speakers a little bit further away from you. These are all trade-offs. Every speaker is a series of trade-offs in design and how you set them up and how you put them in your room and how you listen and all these other factors. So this is why I really like to have data because we can really narrow down things when we're doing comparisons, which the other thing I like about the speaker is it has low distortion and good dynamic range. Good dynamic range just means how good does it sound from low to high volume if you come in with, let's say you're listening to a track from the 80s that was recorded very well. And I say the 80s because the 80s have some of the best production quality of any genre of music or not any genre, but like any decade of music, because that was when the quality of the recordings were getting better. And that was before the dynamic range wars kind of started coming into play where everything was just compressed starting around like the mid nineties and then going on. So you have really the, in my opinion, the best production quality in the eighties to early nineties region. So I'm saying, let's talk about the 80s music, okay? Whatever genre you want to put it in. Typically, you're going to find that you have dynamic range of 10 to about 15 decibels. If you're listening to something that's very compressed, you don't really care about dynamic range. You just care about how loud can it play. But if you are listening to something that's not compressed and you're listening to it at like, let's say, 80 decibels, and then you have a 10 decibel dynamic range peak come in a, a a, a snare hit or something that's 10 decibels instantaneously with electronics and with speakers. If they aren't able to convey that dynamic range, then you're going to basically just get that chopped off. So you're only going to hear like maybe a few dB of dynamic range, but the rest of it's going to be left on the floor. This speaker doesn't really have that problem. And I noticed it when I was listening to again, rap, cause I want to know like, is the bass there at low volume? And as I turn it up, is that bass level still roughly relative to the mid-range and the treble. And when I was listening to rap, that's a really good way to tell that because rap has low content that makes it easier to hear at lower volume. So yeah, these have good dynamic range and I like that as well. 
On the con side, however, I kind of talked about the nonlinearity. I talked about the 630 hertz resonance. I think probably one of the bigger factors here for some of you is going to be the sensitivity of the speaker is pretty low. It's around 82 decibels according to my measurements. And I will say that I have Purify Class D modules, two mono blocks rated at like, gosh, I think they're like 500 watts at four ohm, maybe. Maybe it's 300 watts at four ohm, but it's been plenty for most of the speakers that I listen to. With these speakers, I capped out. I would need more power. Most speaker sensitivity is around 85, 86 decibels for most bookshelf speakers and some floor standard speakers are kind of in that region. So if you're coming from a standard sensitivity bookshelf speaker, you're probably going to need double the power. You're going to need about three decibels more to get you to the output levels that you currently have. So keep that in mind. You're going to probably want to double your power. Now that I've talked about the subjective portion of my listening session, let's talk about the data and use that to kind of explain some of what I heard, what I heard, and then how you can make good assessments of the performance of the speaker and how it might work best for your situation, or if it's something that will work for your situation, okay? So all this data is clap, captured, captured using my Clipple Near Fill Scanner, which you see in this video. It provides me anechoic data. And something I need to remind you all of, or maybe just inform you of if you're new to this channel, flat anechoic response is not the same thing as flat in-room response. So when people say, well, I measured my speakers in my room and they were flat, but they sounded like crap, of course. Flat in-room response almost always sounds like dog piss. If dog piss had a sound, which it does when they're peeing, it just depends on what they're peeing. Anyway, it, it sounds bad. Flat in-room sounds terrible. Flat anechoic without echo and an anechoic in chamber, something like that. That's what you want. I have a video on that. I'll link it here, okay? All right, starting off with the impedance. Overall minimum impedance is about 5.9 ohm. Nominal impedance, six ohm. It really doesn't take a big beefy amplifier in terms of capability to drive this speaker. It's just the sensitivity is low, so you're gonna want extra power. Here is the on-axis response if the speaker is pointing directly at you. Average sensitivity, 81.8 decibels. F3, where it starts to roll off three decibels down from the sensitivity level. 56 hertz down here, F10 at 31 hertz. This is all with the speaker pointed directly at you. What if you tow it out about 20 degrees, like I mentioned, this is what you get. So what you see is it brings down the top end a little bit. Now you still have this peak around 600 Hertz or so, and this is the area where I would recommend you to EQ down. Everything else, I probably wouldn't even bother with EQ on the speaker. The CEA 2034 data set, overall directivity looks pretty good, but it does have some narrowing in the upper mid range, lower treble region, and then at 20 degrees off axis, Kind of the same thing you saw before. You still have that same directivity difference right here. This is the estimated interim response. Now this is captured using all sorts of measurements all around the speaker, above, below, behind, in front, to the side, all of that stuff, 306 degrees all the way around. What this does is it builds a profile of the overall tonal balance of the speaker in a standard room. And it's very, very accurate. Below about 400 Hertz or so, that's really where the room just kind of takes over and it's, it's anybody's guess. But above that, you can use data to easily predict how the speaker is going to sound tonally in your room. And with that said, this blue line that I have on the screen kind of represents the general trend that I was hearing. So I'm noting the in-room extension is down to about 35 hertz. I'm noting that there's this peak right here around 600 hertz. And I say the female vocals sound forward of the mix. And this was the most audible nonlinearity to my ears. This didn't really stand out to me. And then the higher frequency peaking right here didn't really stand out to me, but this did. Now, some of you who've watched my channel and may be waiting for a gotcha moment may say, well, Aaron, why aren't you calling out this dip right here? Why aren't you calling out this? Well, this dip didn't stand out as much as this did. Now, if I EQ this down and then I go to some AB listening test between this and another reference speaker, then these other things will start standing out. But on its own, the speaker sounded pretty good to me. I just would bring this down. This is the burst decay. And it basically kind of gives us an idea of if there's a resonance in the speaker, how long does it take to decay or really how high of a Q resonance is it? So the longer that these hang around, the higher the Q is. Now I'm saying higher Q, I'm not saying high Q, it's kind of like mid to high Q, 
resonance around 2.5K and then around 9K. Now, this kind of looks ish on its own, but it's really not that bad because if we go look at a really bad example, such as this Borison X3, we can see that things can get way worse. So if we go back to the PS Audio FR5, then you can see eh, it's not too bad. We got some high Q resonances, but these also show up in the data that we've already seen. This is the horizontal contour plot. Just, you know, how close is the off-axis response to the on-axis sound, the direct sound versus the reflected sound, all that kind of stuff. So for the most part, the on-axis and the off-axis, this speaker is radiating the sound energy pretty much the same in front and, and to the side of it, except for around one and a half, one to two kilohertz, there's about a 10 degree dip right through there. Now this area is gonna be a little bit harder to equalize if you wanted to equalize this up or to do something to change it. The vertical response window, I'm actually surprised it's about plus or minus 20 degrees. Given that this is using a planar magnetic tweeter, I thought it might be a little bit more narrow in the vertical. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised that it's actually plus or minus 20. I thought it might've been like plus or minus 10. So it's a little bit wider than I thought you might've gotten away with. However, I will note that in the higher frequency above about what 12K, it narrows, but 12K, I mean, most of the people watching this channel probably can't even hear above 12K anyway. Let's just be real. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and then 96 decibels. Both of these look good. Multi-tone distortion looks good other than, see this guy right here? He stands out. Now, when I EQ'd him down, I kind of wonder, hey, maybe the difference that I notice in this forwardness of the, of the mid-range, the, the female mid-range vocal area, maybe that was due to this increased distortion. But I went back and listened at low volume and at higher volume. And I noticed that when I turned the EQ on versus off at low versus high volume, the same effects were there. It basically went from sounding like it was forward in the mix to not forward in the mix, no matter the volume. So I don't really think that this increase in distortion really drove what I was hearing in that regard, but it's still worth noting. And then the overall dynamic range. Earlier, I talked about this and said that it was pretty good. The only area that stands out to me is this particular area. This is high Q, high er Q. So I don't really know if it's gonna be problematic. This dip right through the mid range is about what, 0.7 decibels or so. It's not a huge Delta. Now, normally what I see is when you get into the lower base region, uh, maybe the upper mid base, lower mid base region. So let's say like 120 Hertz to 50 Hertz or something. You start seeing this blue and this purple line go all over the place, which is that really just means that you're losing output as you increase the volume from 76 decibels, which is this black line. It's just my reference point. But I'm not seeing that with this speaker. So overall, for a speaker of its size, I actually think it has pretty good dynamic range. And that does it for this review. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, leave them in the description section and I'll try to answer them. Normally what I do is I'll answer for like the first hour and then I've got to get my butt back to work. So I, this is not my day job. Um, if you would like to support this channel and you appreciate what I'm doing here and you want to do something to help me out, there's two easy ways you can do it. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And I do like behind the scenes stuff. Sometimes I'll do giveaways. I just try to do whatever I can within reason. And finally, the holidays coming up. If you need to buy anything through Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, Walmart, Target, whatever, I've got generic affiliate links in the description below. Just click one of those links and go buy whatever it is that you need to buy. It doesn't matter if it's TV or socks, whatever it is. Uh, that does earn me a small commission at no additional cost to you. And I really appreciate that. And that allows me to keep doing what I'm doing. So with all of that said, I will talk to you all later. Take care.